when it when it they okay people with integrity they express their true opinion they don't care the subject they don't care where they are as long as they tell you the truth even if mtawapigia kelele you say oh we don't want to hear that no that is the fact they tell you the truth as it should be told and again uh, people with integrity they admit their mistakes of which most of us most of the administrators uh, people with integrity they admit their mistakes of which most of us most of the administrators most of the managers most of the politicians most of the leaders they don't admit to their mistakes then uh, uh, Okay, that that point is not coming clear the way I wanted it to be. So I will not come in. I will not give the intent. It will not uh, give the intended message as I wanted it to be. But um, but actually, uh, people with integrity they should act intellectually. They should be honest, and they sh should seek truth always when they are talking to their people. So. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted, I'm very happy, I'm ready for the discussion, I'm ready for the panel. Let us engage, let us share, and please, you politicians, administrators, and what have you, please stop using you. At least, uh, reason, reason with us, and, you know, the problem is that in politics, uh, uh, previously, uh, I'm so sorry to say that, Professor Wakabi, religion was used as a tool, and even today it is used as a tool in politics. That is the fact that we cannot run away from it. And, and again, they started using money as a tool. They have, maybe uh, our, our grandfathers who were in politics there before, they, they were not using money for them to be elected. But today we are using money as a tool of politics. Now, you want to make us tools uh, of politics, we as youths, because where we are going to is that youths have been made tools in politics. You only need us when you want to be elected. And when you elected, you don't listen to us. Then we are just tools which are which are purposely used during elections but after the election we have no we have of no use so if all of us uh, observe ethics and integrity in our offices i think we shall have a better kenya we shall stop comparing kenya and singapore we shall uh, stop thinking of what nicola machiavelli said about kingdom of florentine and start thinking of kenya what what should be done in kenya what should we ensure we have in kenya Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mugambi Kibwi. And at this juncture, we, I know we are hungry. It's uh, almost uh, getting to that uh, red zone of the lunch hour. But just bear with us. We have just a few minutes for the final session. And that is uh, one of the most important sessions, the plenary, where I hope you have your questions. Uh, to direct to the discussants, and I'd like the discussants to kindly make their way to uh, the seats in front here, so that uh, the plenary can direct their questions there. So kindly, um, Bona Governor, um, Prof. Linus, Mr. Kibui, and Dr. Ari, kindly make your way to the front. And as they do that, I want to make a quick announcement. Uh, there's a gentleman, I would like to recognize uh, the presence of uh, Somebody was not recognized earlier from the ESCC. That is uh, uh, the Deputy Director, Corporate Affairs and Communication, uh, Mr. Eric Ngombi. Just kindly wave to the people. Thank you. The journalist, if you're looking for the CEO's speech, kindly see Eric. Uh, he'll give you that. And remember, this uh, event is uh, streaming live on the ESCC's YouTube and Facebook pages. So this is a, very quickly, I just go to the, to the plenary for the questions. So kindly, if you have a question about any of the topics that were discussed earlier, kindly address it to the discussant that you want to answer the question. And then uh, uh, we'll take a few questions, then we'll have uh, the discussants respond to them. We'll start with this gentleman here. Kindly tell us your name. Amanga! Amanga! Uh, I'm Togi Bonfaz. I'm a Pan-Africa. Today, 
Amape for this topic on integrity whereby we have the ethics and the anti-corruption commission with us. My question is on leadership. And before I get there, let me say that our professor Patrice Locke Otieno Lumumba once said that corruption is something we talk about. It is something that is Okay, let me say this because of time. Leadership in institutions is seen to demonstrate a lot of corruption because the leadership is tied to tribalism. Looking on Pony University and other institutions, and here we have the accommodators of corruption, and the leaders that we elect are the actors of corruption. So, if I may ask Mr. Governor Sang, how do we think we can be able to curb this corruption that is based in these institutions? Because I feel the universities are manufacturing the great corruption actors and the great corruption accommodators that are getting outside there to uh, do this act of corruption. Please, our Governor Sang. Thank you, sir, for your question. Uh, let's make the question uh, direct and straight to the, f uh, uh, to the point. Okay, uh, I'm a bit Felix. My question uh, is that after, it is my role as Kenyan or filing a case, especially in the case that I'm directly affected. My second question is, uh, the entrance to fighting corruption sometimes are the repercussions, the consequences that come with reporting case, corruption cases or getting directly involved in such cases or the fear of the unknown. What are some of the measures and mechanisms put in place by ESCs to ensure that those who report corruption cases are protected, especially where one is directly involved in an ongoing case in court? Thank, Thank you. you. Where are your questions going to? Uh, my, my questions are not specific. Any can oh. answer. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I want a lady. Where are the ladies? But uh, please, ladies, kindly indicate uh, who you want your question uh, addressed to. Otieno. Uh, before I say something, someone said corruption, where corruption starts. My, uh, I would like to remind everyone. Especially. I would like to remind everyone, especially the adults who are here. When you tell your son, if you become number one, I'll give you a, a bright bag. What is that? We do it oftenly. So my first question is to the, the ESCC CEO. Yeah, us as young people, when we graduate from these universities, we go out to look for jobs, but we have to, first of all, I have to fill a form and uh, tell DCE, DCI that I'm not a thief for them to give me certification. And also, I also have to tell the CEO of ESCC that I'm not involved in any form of corruption. My question is, why can't you make this, why can't you just ha have simply one document, an ethics document, yeah, an ethics document that maybe incorporates all these so that we, you make it easy for us, so that we are an unemployed person who has no money, is not, is not, money is not taken from me as a person looking for a job. Question number two goes to Governor Sang. There's the culture of corruption within our systems. For example, in counties, there's a culture of corruption in counties because I leave this institution as someone who has ethics and I go into, a, I get employed within the county. It's not just the county, within an institution then you find that there is a culture within this institution. You have to abide by the culture that is there. So my question, Governor, how are you dealing with the corruption cases or the culture of corruption within your county? And what strides have you made? Can you give us real life examples? Thank you. N then, thank you. Thank you. Uh, some questions for the Governor. One question for the ESCC uh, to address. Uh, let's take one more question and then we can have uh, the discussions address the same. Uh, thank you, um, Stephen, taking philosophy. I have uh, a question to uh, 
Professor Francis, because we talk about um, do ethics, do integrity, do integrity really matters? The answer is yes. But people still involved in corruption question uh, matters. So what is it that is more valuable than our own integrity as citizens? And uh, there is one for the media team. Uh, I have a question for, for you people also. Uh, do Christians vote because of uh, uh, ethical backgrounds or because of merits? Because uh, the key problem to the corruption in our country is because of the church, because the church is really being misused in articulating corruption. Thank you. All right, thank you for those questions. Let's go to the discussants and uh, uh, hear from them. Governor, we can uh, begin with the questions that were addressed to you. Thank you very much. I want to, I will pick two questions. Um, the first one is the culture. You know, somebody said that you graduate from Pwani University, you have integrity, and you get into a system. That is partly true, but also not correct. The truth is, as indicated by one of you already, even in terms of, in terms of um, election, even for student leaders in the universities, you know, tribalism is one of those forms of corruption. You know, it's, 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 it's a form of corruption. How do you vote your leaders as student, uh, student leaders? And uh, Eric, the ESCC deputy director, was with me in school. In, camp in campuses, you can actually tell which candidate would win on account of their, the numbers of the students from their ethnic background. You know, it, it, it tells you that already from that small age, you are already practicing corruption. And when you come to a corrupt system in a government institution or in a private sector, you are more than willing. You know, you are already getting into a culture that you had started, you know, planning. So we must all agree that whereas we are failed as leaders, we are failed as institutions, you must also work on it yourself so that you can start with integrity and as you come, come and change. You know, I agree that sometimes it's difficult, it's painful to be a change agent, but who are we waiting for? We must be able to do that ourselves. So I think the culture of corruption in public institutions, we must be able to deal with it, but let us value integrity so that be an agent of change as opposed to just being an agent that, you know, sweets um, uh, the corrupt culture. The second question you have asked, whether reporting corruption or filing corruption, I think, again, um, this is important CEO of ESCC, and I think there are mechanisms for this. Reporting corruption in every institution has consequences. But I think we have had suggestion boxes, we have opportunities, you can write anonymous letters to you know, institutions and also even EACC where you don't need to reveal yourself so that then the process can start. I think that is an opportunity that you need to uh, take advantage of. But in terms of the very specific ones in Nandi, how have I dealt with the situations? The first one, I will just give you two examples. The first one is on issues of um, revenue collection, for example. That is, you know, resources, corruption, uh, resides where resources are. And in county governments, revenue collection is one of those areas that we have had serious issues of corruption. How are we addressing it? For example, digitalization. The more you make the process digital, you make it more difficult for corruption to thrive in those areas. So if we can be able to embrace technology. You know, we are a community and a society and an age that technology is our in thing. Let us invest in technology and provide technological solutions that can address that. But of course, that means you are also running away from the real problem. Instead of changing the person, you are, providing, you are bringing in a system. Again, systems are as good as the people that drive the system. So again, even as you bring in digital solutions, the same corrupt individuals can actually corrupt the systems and still be able to make through with the same. So I think that is a challenge. The second question is that the more you open opportunities for public to engage in processes and decision making, the lesser it becomes. So instead of a decision being made, for example, if you are talking about bursary allocation, instead of having three people making a decision on who gets bursary, open it up 
to more, more to the public and be able to you know have forums with the public and say in this community in this village who is more deserving of getting this bursary the more you open up the better it is but again if you are opening up to a more corrupt society you are still running back to the same same problem so i think really it is the inborn we must deal with the software you know all these situations are you know we are dealing with hardware let us go to the software and deal with real situations let me just give to the other you know uh, panelist thank you prof there was one for you yes yes there was one for me and this is how i'll go about it you have a student and i'm proud of you you have asked whether there is something more important than ethics now that we are saying integrity matters i would say yes there is something more important what is more important life life and it's obvious we can't manufacture life economics tells you when you have such a thing which you cannot buy which you cannot make the most important thing. So ethics is life enhancing. Corruption is life undermining. Unfortunately, when we are used to judging things physically and immediately, we miss the point. You cannot take care of future generations. You cannot take care of uh, people you cannot see. You imagine that life is all about yourself. That's the problem. And this is what I would say, that um, the giver of life, which we have said is the most important thing, is God himself. And I said, the best anti-corruption text I've read is the Bible. The Bible says, as long as you live, there is hope. But unfortunately, Corrupt people think as long as you have money, there is hope. No, it is life that gives hope. And as long as you are alive, you can make the most out of it and money will follow. Unfortunately, now when we value money more than life and we can sacrifice life at the altar of money, we get things the other way around. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Linus, one for you. Uh gentleman asked, when Kenyans are electing their leaders, should they look at performance and merit or integrity? That's a great question. I, I cannot possibly imagine that you can be a performer without integrity. The two are not separable. Integrity is what makes you, is that quality of the person. So yes, Kenyans should look at integrity first. By the way, for all the problems you think we have around corruption, is because for all the time you have voted, you've thought performance is better than integrity. And that is why when this ESTC lit more than 241, if I remember that number, 214, in 2022, listed them that this is unfit for office. What did the voter do? They packed the entire team, nearly all of them. It became like an endorsement. So integrity matters. It's really what makes one perform in the first place. Because that performance that you think and call performance is actually sometimes very fake because it could be of someone, and, 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 and uh, we've heard about this, that these people perceived as corrupt are good givers. They give. They'll give you school fees, they'll give somebody uh, money to build a house, and all that. But you never ask, how? Where is the wealth coming from? If you ask that, then you will realize that uh, that integrity matters than doing hard work. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, maybe, Dr. you can add something. And there's somebody who asked, uh, 
When your child performs well in school and you, you tell them, if you become number one, I'll give you chocolate, is, isn't that where corruption starts? I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Before you go to the next round. Thank you. Um, that's an interesting one. Of course, when the parent is doing that, they're looking at it as an incentive, not as corruption. But I do know, even as a guardian myself, I have bribed a child to study. Like, okay, to, I'll get you, you know, the soda, but that is, I'm talking about a child in lower primary. So there is a level where they, the children don't understand why they are studying, you know, lower primary and what. And today, you know, you improved in your marks, so we'll go out for chips. Or today you, you did, you are number one, so we did this. But by the time they are in, uh, like, form one and form two, you start reasoning with them like a grown-up. And that starts changing things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go for one final round. Uh, for one more round, uh, let's start here. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Sarah Wallace, and my question is directed to you, Mr. Linus Kakai. I wanted to speak, actually, on behalf of my students. Uh, a lot of them, when we give them handouts in the lecture hall, believe it or not, uh, those handouts are in their phones. They use their phones to follow the lesson. Uh, the old-fashioned days of distributing paper handouts are out the window. Now, what are the media houses doing about attracting our youth? Because they use their phones uh, for like three quarters of the day. If they're not studying, they're being entertained, or they're in touch with each other. Our media houses are perhaps thinking of applications that would appeal to the youth. Uh, so that uh, they can use those applications and learn from them, uh, in which case everything we're talking about here today uh, can actually bear fruit if our students are busy learning about this and being inducted into this way of thinking. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Dr. Salim. My question goes to the Chairman of Governors, the governor for Nandi County. In relation to governors in the country, I don't know whether you have a, a, a machinery on how to know the level of corruption done by governors in relation to employment. Because you'll get that in a county, almost 95% of those who are employed are locals, and not only locals, but uh, relatives of uh, the governor or people who are within the system. That's one. Two, in relation to EACC, because we have always noticed that what they talk about is uh, corruption and uh, drug abuse. I don't know whether you as governor, you have uh, strategies in curbing LGBTQ and lack of morals in universities and colleges. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. My question is gendered as usual. Are we going to categorize sex as a corruption issue? Because my girls have to have additional documents behind here apart from their certificates. And they'll be beaten fired for them to get a job. So are we going to categorize sex as a corruption issue? And I want to correct our guest today. Theology is not easily theorized uh, uh, theology. I am a theologian, and I have credible certificates that were cleared by the Commission for University Education. I did my master's in the Netherlands, Protestant University, and my PhD from Stellenbosch University, South Africa. So theology is not easily uh, gushed. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, let's take one final one from this side and then we we'll go to the other side. Uh, thank you, my name is Moses Isutsa. <clears throat> I am a librarian. And I do a lot of classification of knowledge. So there are times you find one word can have more than one meaning. In all the discussions we've had here, from uh, ESCC themselves, from the leadership, the governor, 
they have said that corruption is in all of us. It has embedded in us in a very strong way. I want to put it to us, all the panelists, and ask, why can't we formalize corruption? Why are we fighting corruption, yet it is working? Because it's a tool that is working, and then just regulate the levels of corruption, because we are not succeeding in the fight. Why can't we formalize corruption? Thank you for that very controversial question. Maybe that's where we need to go to the panelists. I want to go to the, to the ESCC CEO. A couple of questions have been asked to you, starting with that one. And then somebody asked, uh, can we categorize? Oh, thank you. Can you I want to, somebody asked if we can categorize sex. And somebody says, should we have a singular document? For I have several comments to make. From the quasi preacher professor, it has been proven beyond any doubt that the most corrupt countries are the most religious. If you look at the least corrupt countries, are, the, are those countries which, when you look at their re religious demography, they say irreligion, 80%. Sweden, Denmark, Norway. But these countries which, in fact, today, if you tell me you are born again or you are Muslim with that marquee, I will not trust you just because you have told me that. In fact, I will question you more. Because religion is used as a cover, including this country. So I know you're a philosopher. When I retire next year, I'll come and approach you. Maybe you'll be my supervisor. And my thesis will be, is religion a solution to corruption? And then you supervise me. <laughs> but, but please don't fail me because I can see you are born again Christian. <laughs> we, 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 I'll come and see you, Professor. I am so happy that you've raised that matter. When I retire, I am registering here for PhD. <laughs> Faces is religion a solution to corruption. Somebody asked about the clearance form uh, that they pay money to be told whether they are thieves, whether they whatever. ESCC, we don't charge any money on that. We don't charge any money. We appeared before a Senate committee where it was defending the youth that those things should be removed. Or if they are done, they should be under one portal and free of, uh, of charge. But you see, when you fill in the e-citizen, you have to pay some money. And the argument makes sense because they say for one application, you require about 3,000 3, to 5,000 sh shillings. This is a job seeker from the university. If you make 10 applications, that's 30,000. Where does this young man or young lady uh, give, uh, 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 get money from? There's a very important question a lady asked whether uh, do sex, does sex add to corruption? Yes, it adds. I was, in, uh, I was in Rwanda, and part of the billboards that they put uh, is that sexual harassment and sexual, uh, for employment and growth for a woman is cor grave corruption. It is. It is because Sometimes ladies suffer. Ladies suffer many ways. They suffer from the university, although sometimes they are to blame. You have decent ladies who work hard and they are harassed by supervisors. And there are those ladies, and then, uh, you know, men are weak and then they, they succumb to other things. So we need, we need a very, if you look at the Public Officers Ethics Act, it, it defines sexual harassment as persistent pressure for sexual favors. Somebody will ask you, do you go to a lady first day and uh, she succumb? You have to move some moves every now and then. So it becomes amorphous. There's a very big problem and it's up to you, uh, Mwalimo. Ladies should come, should come out with something that can put a person in a corner if that person is accused of sexual harassment. Today, it becomes very difficult. There are lawyers here. They will tell you there's a problem. You may see there's a harassment, but if you suck that person and he takes you to court, you're in trouble. There's a guy who said that we should uh, accept corruption. Can you, can you stand up? Uh, a very good question. Let me ask you, students, we have ESCC, You've heard the governor saying we, we harass uh, politicians, investigating them, cases taking too long. 
with ESC, we have such a level of corruption. What will happen without ESC? What will happen? If today there is no ESC, a governor can bring all his relatives. Eh? There's a county where a governor told most of his supporters, go and get fake certificate, I employ you here. We are dealing with that case. Governors employ their brothers, their sisters. They, te they tell you it's, it's nowhere. And uh, there's, you've said something very well, uh, the governor, that the Western world, the developed world, are also corrupt. But I want to give you an example. I attended a course, an FBI course in Miami on corruption. We were from 37 countries. And the head of FBI dealing with corruption is the one who opened the cause. Luckily, that man had worked in Nairobi for three years at the FBI office in Nairobi. He even speaks some Swahili. So he told us the corruption in the poor country and the developed country is like this. Listen to me. If you have a mango farm and then you get all your mangoes in a pickup, full, as you are driving to Kilifi to sell them at the market, you feel to relieve yourself in a petrol station. When you walk in, somebody comes with a basket, he removes some mangoes at the top, fills the basket, and he leaves. When you come out, can you tell the mangoes that have been stolen? You cannot. Now, that is the corruption in the developed world. In, an Af in African countries, you have a basket of mangoes. You feel like relieving yourself. That is what happened with us. We are poor and we are stealing a lot. The Mzungus are rich, they are stealing less. So, it is very difficult for the developed world professor and others to notice that there is corruption. This Mzungus corruption is there. High tech, they do it. Eh? When, when they do campaigns in America, they spend billions. Have you had a political party going to the bank to take loan for campaign? Where do they get their money? Through? Although they don't call it corruption, they call it lobbying. So ours, I think, is that the, the corruption in our countries, you can, mani you can see it physically. When you drive, roads have portals. When you go to hospital, there is no medical, proper medical care. When you guys leave university, there is no employment. So we have to address the issue of corruption. So you cannot say we liberalize corruption. You cannot. It will be, it will be worse. It will be worse. So, and, uh, and the other thing that we need to know, corruption is not only a problem in Africa. It's a global problem. It's a very serious global problem. Look at the Americans. The Americans have privatized prison service. Prison service now is a multi-billion industry. How does that one, how does corruption come in in the prison service in America? The lawmakers lobby that illegal immigrants now should not be let free to stay in homes. They should be incarcerated in prisons like other criminals. But the objective is to make sure that prisons are full of prisoners and they make more money and the people who run those prisons, they end up bribing the congressmen and the senators as a result of that. So they do corruption. Even this corruption that we have, they're the ones who trained us. Africans never used to corrupt. Unenda kwa chief, unangalwa mambo yako. After some time, unipa chief, nimeleta imaya imbili. It's a token. It's not, it's not bribery. But then now they came with another system. So we have to understand it's a problem that is all over the world. France, Italy formed anti-corruption bodies about eight, five years ago. They realized it's a threat to national security. If you go to the website, go and Google American anti-corruption strategy of 2021. America came out with a strategy in 2021 that corruption is a problem to their country. They have been downplaying it, but now they have come out with a strategy on how to address corruption in their country. So this is a problem globally, and you know very well, if you are a drunkard or you, you are somebody who does substance abuse, for those who, who do counseling professor, the first thing to treat that person is him to accept that he has a problem. If he's on denial, you are doing nothing. So we are not on denial. 
And we are not saying, Governor, that we are not doing a good job. The governors do a good job. I'm from Kilifia. Now, when I walk to Charomai, I walk to the prison, I walk to St. Thomas Road, I see Tamak Road. I can tell devolution has brought development. But then, out of those developments, you know what has happened also. Vitu Mekatwakato Kochini. So we are not saying that there's a, it's a problem that cannot be addressed. We say let us address it right now the way somebody who is a drunkard accepts to go to a rehabilitation center and undertake a process. So on my side, that is all. Professor, next year I'm coming to see you. Thank you, Bono. See you. Bono Governor, there was one for you. Thank you very much. I think one, one of the questions that was asked is about employment in counties. Again, institutional corruption. You know, in counties, a governor ought not to influence employment because there is a county public service board that is expected to be independent. Again, in real life, that in most cases doesn't happen. So really, we... You know, it's a whole value system. You know, you have people in offices, they are given the responsibility, the law is clear, but still people flout those laws. How do you deal with it? I mean, I think it is, it all boils down to what Kaikai said here. There has to be a punishment for corruption. You know, as long as it is not painful, it's not expensive, it is not difficult to engage in corruption, people will continue doing it. So I wish we can be able to deal with that situation. Unfortunately, again, we have only one ESCC for one country. We have 47 counties. We have parastatals over 500. We have national government ministries and departments. How we expect ESCC to deal with everything at the same time is crazy. But I hope also as a strategy sometimes, you may just want to pursue two, three, and use them as examples. Because how do you, you know, you must just find a way also of ensuring that you have two, three cases taken to logical conclusions with clear um, outcomes. And that can be able to be also a lesson, you know, across board. So I think you must just find a way of dealing with this. Unfortunately, somebody mentioned about legalizing corruption. Part of the problem is that corruption, as much as we all agree that corruption eats into the future of our country, we are not mad enough about it. We still make casual comments like that. You know, you, if, if, if Kenyan says, why don't we legalize corruption and, you know, let's make it a way of life. Really? It actually means we do not appreciate how bad this thing is, how bad it is for our economy, how bad it is for our future. Maybe Kenyans also are part of the problem. We must be mad about corruption and be able to speak it out and find ways and means of dealing with it instead of being casual about it and thinking, you know, it, it is part and parcel of life, you know. And finally, the corruption cases take too long. I insist, it takes too long. The institutions given the responsibility sometimes work at cross purpose. We must find, and maybe it is designed to, to work that way. You know, you need to ask yourself, so who are the people who made the law? Members of parliament? You know, so the question is, we must just ask ourselves, are we having these laws operating at cross purpose for a reason? If that is the case, we must just review and ensure, maybe uh, to Alib here, if we had given him the powers to investigate and prosecute, now we can actually hold him to account when a case collapses. But now you tell him investigate, he says, I have investigated. You have DPP who says, no, it was not investigated properly. Then you have a judge on the other end who says, no, the case was not presented and prosecuted in court properly. So we have three institutions. Again, we cannot say, let's collapse all the institutions and have only one institution. Again, that has proven in the past that it can be misused. So we must just be honest as Kenyans that this thing is eating into the future of our nation. Let's just be honest and say we must just deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, Linus. There was one for you. And there's one here from Dima Bilton who says you have been to the media. You have been at the forefront fighting corruption by exposure of uh, corrupt institutions like the Masai Mara University case. How was that experience and how can you enhance and expand it to the political uh, class? Thank you very much. Let me start with a question from uh, Dr. Sally, and that was on what we in the media do to basically reach the Gen Zs. 
It's a very good question because it is the challenge of every media house right now uh, on two fronts. The first front is on the consumption habits of the, this generation. They are markedly different from previous generations. This generation here, most of these guys here, very few of them actually sit in front of a TV to consume news at 9 o'clock and at 7 o'clock. They want it on the go and on the palm of their hands and that's on the mobile phone. What this has forced us to do is to adopt means that accesses them at their point of convergence, which is the mobile phone. So all media, media houses, and I want to speak of the Royal Media Services, we are very big, we have an entire digital division, packed with mostly young people who speak a language that I sometimes don't understand. I tell them, okay, in, in real terms, what do you want? And they're saying, this story is too long the story of the president, can you reduce it? But I tell them, no, that's actually how long he spoke. I said, no, no, I just want to hear the salient points, not everything. So when you come to Royal Media, we now have a huge digital division, uh, which is mostly packed by uh, 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 the young, who are teaching us also in terms of their new emerging consumption habits. The other thing that uh, emerges, I said there are two things. One is the consumption habit, and number two is the content. They are, not, they, they are also very different in terms of what they are looking for in a news bulletin and in entertainment. It's very specific, very focused. It's not the old way of trying to give them everything from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. that you have this and that program. And by the way, they need everything in very short, crisp form. Which is why, and say um, uh, you can call me out at the back there, what you consume most on YouTube and Facebook is Reels. That's your first choice. True? Yeah, because they're about 30 seconds max. And then they now decide, based on that Reel, do I need to know more about uh, the, the same topic? So we are, they are running us at high speed, uh, Daktari, uh, th that's what, what they're doing. To the question of media and uh, corruption investigations, the Masai Mara University story was very interesting. First of all, for media, doing anti-corruption stories can be a risky undertaking. A risky on many different fronts, including the physical safety of the journalists that go out there to investigate. If you remember the Masai Mara University, it included secret filming, meaning we went into the Masai Mara University secretly. Uh, some of the key suspects, if you remember the conversations in hotels, were also filmed secretly. There was a time he actually, one of the suspects noticed um, the equipment. And uh, our reporter was very clever to explain it away, uh, that it is just something to do with the heart pacer that he uses. The, the investigating journalist was very young. There is no way he could be using a heart pacemaker. But he said, no, this, this is my pacemaker. I need it to support me. I have blood pressure issues. He gave some excuse to, uh, to do with uh, health. So it's very risky. Uh, but it's also frustrating. Because the finding by media may not be upheld in court. First of all, media can't prosecute. You can only show. You can only say this is what happened. These are the documents we have. The duty of prosecuting belongs to someone else, and that's the Directorate of Public uh, Prosecutions. If they don't take it up, then it becomes a problem. If ESCC also uh, doesn't come on board, it becomes another uh, problem. Another challenge we face is that of legal uh, challenges. In the Masai Mara case, for example, we were taken to court by the prime suspect, you know, and we have a court case uh, uh, about that. Here is one challenge, and I need to challenge the ESCC team, because sometimes when media does that, we d and, and, and it doesn't get the support of the agencies, then you are let out to hang. And maybe I should let the CEO know also that increasingly we've been taken to court 
for stories that are coming out of the ESCC itself, which is very interesting. That, oh, based on this statement, and I give a simple one like uh, your advisory on elections, this and that candidate should not be, be cleared based on, and I remember it was a very well written report, complete with reasons. Some of the media houses have been pursued by those people that were mentioned in the ESCC report, and we don't get the ESCC to say, no, this is our document, and we, we stand by it. So, corruption also, fighting corruption also is uh, uh, an effort that should be uh, multi sectoral. And lastly, I just wanted to speak to the point the librarian. Did he leave the room? The librarian that uh, I interpreted your view differently. I didn't take it literally. I felt that is a statement of frustration. Because despite all this that we do, despite all the talk, the fight against corruption has actually been less successful than more successful. And there'll be a lot of people like him who say, come on, why don't you just legalize these things? Some of the things that happen currently are so blatant, they are so blatant in terms of flying across the, the face of whether it's the Public Procurement uh, Act or even the Mother uh, Integrity uh, chapter in the Constitution, we have a problem. And there'll be more frustrated people like him will say, why don't we legalize this thing, we just do it properly. But um, I understand uh, your, your frustration. And finally, I just wanted to speak to the point raised by um, the, the CEO and about comparing other countries. I don't want us to fall into that trap. Let's not fall into the trap of, for example, comparing ourselves with France, comparing ourselves with America, comparing ourselves with anything more sophisticated than Somalia. I know we are Kenyans, we like sometimes overrating ourselves. Some of the things we do here on the integrity and corruption front, we can't even hold a candle to a small country that is called Rwanda. In Rwanda, law and order works. I know there are a lot of discussions whether they, it works the old way. Whether, whichever way you see it, it works. Simple things like corruption, simple things like basic offenses, like not wearing a helmet as a motorcyclist, that is basic. We don't wear uh, helmets. In Rwanda, you'll be punished for it. In, so I want us to come down from our tall ivory tower in terms of how we think about ourselves and address the basics. Because when we keep saying it's actually all over, back to the integrity issue, we were talking about uh, self, the self, the person. If you were to walk, and this is a big university, from where we were in the moon block to this place, you find three or four bad people urinating in public. You don't do it as a fifth person and say, no, it's done all over, it's all over. We, we need to shift from that. Because that is also slowing down our attitude in terms of fighting uh, uh, corruption. And by the way, lastly, the other day we had something called the gray listing of Kenya by the financial advisory services, if you remember the gray listing. What does gray listing do? Gray listing spoils your reputation as a country. It means you are listed with the crooks. And this is because we've taken small things and played them as small. There's something called wash wash that has become a big culture. When people get into this fake money printing, that is the first step towards get, getting gray listed. Because even the integrity of your financial systems is then doubted. Because how much of our shillings then that are in circulation are actually legal tender? Or have they just been printed uh, in the back streets of, of Nairobi? So guys, we need to go back to the basics and we need to start comparing ourselves with our actual age mates that include Rwanda, Somalia, Uganda, Tanzania. Let's start there. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, because of time, uh, I know this is a discussion that we can have the entire day, but that is where we'll uh, come to the end of the uh, 
panel and plenary uh, session. Kindly let's applaud our panelists. Asante Nisana, you can uh, just take your seats. Thank you so much. Um, uh, at this juncture, I want to call upon um, the Dean of Students at Pwani University, Dr. Patricia Mbogo, to uh, give us a vote of thanks. The CEO, ESCC, Mr. Twali Mbarak, the Governor Nandi County, His Excellency Stephen Arabsang, Member of Parliament, Kilifi North, and Deputy Leader of Majority, National Assembly, Honorable Owen Bayer, our Vice Chancellor, Puan University, Professor James Kahindi, our Deputy Vice Chancellors, the discussants, our development partners, ESCC, UNODC, the executive management and staff of ESCC, academic staff of Pwani University, our esteemed students, comrades of Pwani Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, the management board, Pwani University staff, I am humbly, I am extremely humbled to extend a real hearty vote of thanks to the keynote speaker of today, the CEO of ESCC, Mr. Twali Mbarak. It is always a pleasure to have you at Pwani University, Mr. Mbarak. Thank you for the well-delivered keynote address that has captured the young minds of our youth and clearly empowered them to understand the indicators and risks of the lack of integrity. You very well captured the importance of societal values and why we need to res restore these values. Your mantle of ensuring that corruption becomes a high-risk venture in Kenya is one in which Pwani University is proud to be associated with. We deeply appreciate you for choosing Pwani University as a place to deliver this keynote address, Karibu Tena Pwani University. To the Governor, His Excellency Stephen Arabsang, we are glad you could join us at Pwani University. Feel at home, away from home. As a youthful governor, we are happy to have you impress upon our young students that it is possible to be a leader with integrity, even as a youth. That as a young man, it is possible to earn the respect of the elderly and be given an opportunity to lead. You are truly a role model for our youth and the older generation. We recognize and we acknowledge your message that this country cannot afford the level of corruption that exists. That corruption must not win and that yes, integrity matters. To our very own MP, Member of Parliament and Deputy Leader of Majority in the National Assembly, Honorable Owen Bayer, Pan University will always be home for you and we always look forward to your homecoming. Thank you for being part of this event and impressing on the importance of integrity and its effect on the future of our youth. We appreciate your efforts in building the capacity of the youth in Kilifi County. To all our discussants, we wish to applaud you for engaging, for the engaging discussions. Thank you for opening up our minds and bringing us to appreciate the value of integrity in governance among the youth. The discussions have generated ideas and new perceptions on issues of integrity. The discussions were lively and engaging. We appreciate all the participants who took their time to research, analyze, and initiate the relevant discussions highlighting the real issues plaguing governance in our country. Thank you very much. To our special guests, the comrades, we are extremely happy that you could make it. Thank you for taking your time to attend this public lecture by the very CEO of, given by our very CEO of ESCC, Mr. Twali Mbarak. 
We value you and appreciate your contribution in governance. Thank you, comrades. To the staff of EACC, Puan University, and the development partners, this event would not have taken place without your contribution. Participation and presence. We value your role and appreciate you taking the time to organize, finance, implement, and ensure that this event is a success. I say kudos to all of you. Thank you very much. And finally, to our host, the Vice Chancellor Puan University, Professor James Kahindi, thank you for accepting to host this event at Puan University and ensuring that everything flowed seamlessly to make this event a success. We appreciate the effort and are grateful to have had this opportunity to listen to the great gurus on matters of integrity. To all of us, you have been a great audience. It is not possible to mention all, but be assured that your presence here is highly appreciated. May the Almighty God keep you all safe and pamoja tuangamize ufisadi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Dean. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, the Reverend and uh, the Sheikh to just uh, close for us with a word of prayer. Comrades Power, we are saying no to sexually transmitted marks. Hello? Together we are saying no to sexually transmitted marks. And we are saying yes to integrity because integrity matters. Mambo ya kupigana mujulus to make a Mambo ya kinembe to make a ta. Tunasoma kwa BD to pate certificate to pate kazi. Let us pray. God, we want to thank you for your grace and mercies. Thank you for honoring us with your presence in our midst. We cannot take it for granted. Integrity matters. We shall live a life of dignity if we value integrity. We want to thank you for everybody represented here, that they took their time to think about the dignity of the youth so that all we can say, God, that our lives matters and that valuing you, we shall value one another. We pray for our country. My father, that integrity shall infiltrate every aspect of our lives for your glory. Send our guests home with your blessings, your grace and mercies with divine protection. We thank you for our able vice chancellor. We continue to commit him unto your hands, covering him with the blood of Jesus Christ and praying God that you continue to use him as an instrument of change that shall infiltrate every aspect of our society in our country and the world for your glory. In God's name we pray. Amen. Get ready for the word of prayer. God the Almighty, the only God whom we worship, we are really thankful for the bounties you have given us since the beginning to the end. For those who are going for journey masses, lead them to their families well. For whatever we have discussed here, bestow them in our brains. Give us energy to implement them. Empower our youths and our endeavor in whatever we are doing. You know you are the one who said, وَقُلِ عِمَلُوا فَسَيَرُ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ You are the one who said, work and the Almighty shall see your work and uh, reward you accordingly. We are asking you to reward us on better things we have done. For wherever we have gone astray, forgive us. We are weak, we are human beings. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I have just uh, one final announcement. All participants are uh, welcome for lunch after the session. Uh, the students will have their lunch at the main dining hall near the administration block, the old administration block. And the invited guests uh, will have their lunch at the resource center. I believe someone will be uh, showing everybody where they're supposed to go. 
And I'd like to thank you all for uh, your time today, for being uh, such a wonderful audience. My name is Ben Kitili. Good afternoon.